Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you for being here with us this morning. God bless you for being in the room and joining us online as well. Well, a lot of times I like to start with a little bit of vision casting about what God's doing in our church, about what's next, about what's coming up. And um, we've already mentioned this morning about um, where we're going to be moving. We're purchasing land and a building, and you've been giving to that, and I just am so thankful for that, uh, for your faithfulness. Let me just give you a, a brief update on where we are. We've been I told you we hired lawyers to deal with um, dealing with all of the permits that we've got to get and all this different kind of stuff. And we're in that process. And we have spoken to the uh, commissioners, and they think that everything's going to be okay. Uh, But you know how politicians can change their mind. So we're going to make sure everything is uh, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. But we're on target, and we're moving forward, and uh, we're very excited about Uh, the property that we're going to purchase and the building that uh, we're going to purchase. And uh, so you continue to pray. You continue to give. You continue to be faithful. I believe that we've got some great, great days ahead of us. And so thank you for being a part of that. How many of you did the prayer and fasting uh, the past week or so? Would you raise your hand? You participated in that. Many of you, thank you for that. Please let me know what God spoke to you about, what God did in your life. I've already heard from a lot of people, and it's just been very exciting to see how God uh, opened people's eyes. He showed them things, things that maybe they need to improve on in their attitude and different things, and it's just been very encouraging. So I hope you'll do that. Send me an email. uh, Let me know uh, what God has done in your life, and I think it's going to be very exciting and very encouraging for our church. And so I I want to let you know that we appreciate you with that. Well, we're in this series called How God Turns Setbacks into Comebacks, and we've been going through some stories in the book of Joshua. And today, I'm going to talk to you, uh, started talking about this a little bit last week, dealing with your past. So today, I want to talk to you about what to do with your past. And we're going to look at a very interesting story today. Uh, The last couple weeks, we've talked about what to do when you fail. And we all fail, we all sin, we all fall short. What do you do? Uh, Last week we talked about what do you do when you're afraid. And we all have fears that come up at different times in our lives. And so today we're going to talk about what do you do with your past. You know, people that don't understand the Bible or that maybe have never read the Bible think that the Bible is actually something different than it actually is. Uh, But what I've learned about the Bible is it gives us stories of real people. And these heroes that we read about in the Bible, they're just normal people. They're just real people like you and me. And the Bible shows us their warts and all. It doesn't sugarcoat it. And the story we're going to read about today is not one of those sugarcoated stories. In fact, you've probably heard of this woman before. And... um, Well, and the Bible kind of describes her with a word that we don't really use today, but the woman's name was Rahab, and the Bible says that Rahab was a harlot. Now, we would say prostitute today, but when you really study it, Rahab was most likely a prostitute that also owned a brothel. She also owned an inn, and that, you know, Uh, where the spies went that we're going to look at today. Um, And and she has this incredible story of how God redeemed her past and turned a setback in her life into a comeback. And so we're going to talk about how God does that and how he uses people in incredible ways. Now, let me just give you her story in a nutshell so you'll uh, be caught up if you haven't heard the story before. Um, We know the story of how God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And of course, because of their unbelief, they weren't able to enter into the promised land quickly, but they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the end of that 40 years. Moses has died. God has raised up Joshua as the leader of the nation of Israel, and he is on the verge of taking them into the promised land. It is an incredible story of God's grace 
in their lives and a picture of God's grace in our lives. So today, the story that we're picking up is right before they go into the promised land, and Joshua has sent two spies to spy out the land, to gather intel, uh, to do some reconnaissance, to case out the joint, whatever you want to say. And the first city that they were going to be attacking or overthrowing and possessing was the city of Jericho. Now, in the next weeks, we're going to talk about uh, how they surrounded Jericho. And you know the story of they marched around the walls, and on the seventh day, they marched seven times, and the walls fell down. So that is that city, and they're checking it out, and they're getting ready to go into the land, and God is getting ready to give them a great victory. Well, these two men, they went into the city, and as people would do, they went to a public house. They went to this inn, which was also a brothel. Now, think of westerns, western movies. Anybody ever watched a western movie? You know what I'm talking about. And on those westerns, they'll have a saloon in there. And oftentimes, that's the place where people gather news. It's where they gather together. And uh, often in a western movie, there would be uh, the prostitutes that will be in the saloon or connected with the saloon as well. So that's kind of the picture of the spies going in. Now, don't let your mind go crazy. They were not going in to sleep with the prostitutes. They were going in uh, simply to gather information. It would be a public place where news was gathered. And so they went into this, uh, this inn, this brothel, and the king of Jericho heard about this, and he sent spies, I'm sorry, soldiers, to capture and kill the spies. So it's already a very interesting story. I mean, you can make a movie out of this. And what happened was Rahab made a decision. She made a life-altering, life-changing decision. She decided that she was going to side with the God of Israel. And this was really a great act of faith. Rahab uh, took these two Jewish men and she hid them on the roof. Now you have to understand that back in those days they almost always had a roof that you could walk around on and often as was this case there would be uh, leaves or uh, flax or some kind of plant and leaves that they would cover the roof with and so these two spies went up there and she gave them instructions and she covered them over so that the king's soldiers could not capture them. Now, this incredible act of courage announced her faith in the God of Israel. And as we're going to see in the story, she lowers them down after the soldiers had left and she misdirected them. She lowers these two Israelite spies down. Uh, her house was on a wall or in the wall, and she lowered them down from a window in the wall. And the Bible says that she lowered them from a red Cord. We're going to talk about the significance of that in just a moment. But before she did, she asked them to deal kindly with her and her family. And they made a pact with her that if she would hang this red cord from her window, that they would spare her and her family when they attacked. And of course, Rahab's actions would have been considered treason against the king of Jericho. And this announced her shifting of allegiance from the gods of Jericho to the Lord God Jehovah, the God of the Israelites. So we're going to pick up the story in Joshua chapter 2, and we're only going to read a few verses today, verses 8 through 11. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how God had, the Lord had dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og. Let that name sink in for just a minute. Og. That sounds like a caveman, doesn't it? I mean, that's the worst name I think I've ever heard in my life. Og, what's your name? Og. I'm sorry, what did you say? Og. What is your name? Og, me Og, Og, Og. I, I don't know, I, my mind goes crazy, I'm sorry. 
Sihon and Og, whom you devoted, uh, devoted rather to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Well, this story of faith, this story of Rahab turning away from her past and giving it to God through her faith, announcing that she believed in the same God that you and I believe in, and that she received him in the same way that you and I receive him. Rahab took her past and put it into the hands of a merciful God. She confessed her faith in God, and God, in his great mercy, forgave her. Now, in the same way, you and I do, should do the same thing today. We take our past. We take all of those sins. And you know, there are different pasts today. Some of us have a more sordid past than others. Some of us have a more innocent past than others. I've told you before that I received Christ as an eight-year-old boy. Now, as an eight-year-old boy, I'm here to tell you I'd never robbed a bank before. I'd never done cocaine. I wasn't a drug dealer. I'd never murdered anybody I'd never participated in uh, some kind of sordid kind of lifestyle about mostly what I had done at eight years old. I'd probably eaten some food that my mom told me not to eat. I'd probably stolen some cookies. She probably caught me a few times because food was something that my life revolved around quite a bit. And uh, whenever my mom told me I couldn't have some, I would always sneak some. But that was probably that and some lies that you tell as a kid was probably about the extent of the wickedness in my life. But did you know that even a person that is moral, even a person that considers themselves to be good, even a person that has lived a good life needs saving just like Rahab did. It doesn't matter what your past is like. We must give it to God and let him redeem it. And when he does, We have a very bright future ahead of us. So today, I want to talk to you just about three things of what Jesus does with our past when we give it to him. What does Jesus do with our past? Well, here's the first thing he does. He redeems it. He redeems it. Aren't you glad that God redeems us from our sins? Look at what she claimed about God, her statement of faith in God. She said, for the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Make no mistake, the reason that God saved Rahab was the same reason that he saves you and me. Not because we've been good, not because we've done good things, but rather because of our faith. And in the same way Rahab put her faith in God, you and I put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And when we do, God promises to save us. He will redeem our past. You see, God redeemed Rahab through her faith. Now, I told you about this scarlet cord that they uh, said to put in the window. Uh, Very interesting. There are some parallels to it in Scripture that I find very interesting and I think that are types of what Jesus Christ did for us. The first thing I think about is that Jesus told his disciples after he resurrected from the grave that the Bible is filled with imagery about him. The Bible is filled with, if you will, types of about Jesus Christ. The Bible says that after his resurrection, he was walking on the road to Emmaus with two of the disciples, not the 12, but rather two of the 70, uh, because it names one of them. One of them's name was Cleopas. And we know that Cleopas was not one of the 12 disciples, but he was one of the 70 disciples that followed Jesus around. And so uh, they had been uh, walking on this road and Jesus appeared to them. And he said, what's going on? And They said, haven't you heard that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified and now they say he's resurrected from the grave and all Israel is in this uproar over it. And the Bible tells us that Jesus began at Moses and the prophets and he explained to them about himself concerning the scriptures. 
And I really do believe that is one thing that you and I must keep in mind when we read the Bible. Did you know that as a Christian, as a believer, you can read the Bible? Now, is it important to have a pastor? Is it important to be taught the Word of God? Absolutely. But I want you to understand something, that as a believer, you don't have to have a seminary degree or a Bible college degree in order to read the Bible and to understand it. Now, you need to be taught, you need to study, that's for sure, but you can read the Bible on your own. And Jesus opened their minds, it says, and told them about the Scriptures, told them about Himself. So we know that in the Bible there are types. There are types of Christ. When you read uh, in the book of Genesis, you'll see some types of Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 3, where it talks about how Adam and Eve sinned and how God asked Adam. He said, where are you, Adam? And he said, well, I hid myself, and you know the story. The Bible tells us that God brought a curse on the serpent, which, of course, was Satan himself. And he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And we know that a woman doesn't have a seed, only the man has a seed. He was referring to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ that will come many thousands of years later. And uh, he said, I, that he will, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. That was about Jesus. That was about Jesus dying on the cross as our Messiah. That was about Jesus defeating Satan. That was about Jesus giving us the redemption that only his death on the cross could do. So we know that in the Bible there are types, there are pictures of Jesus Christ. Well, I believe this red cord shows how God redeems us. It certainly reminds us of the blood of Christ. It could be a type of that. There are other things that it could be also in the Bible. I want to share with you a couple of them. Um, we, we see the, uh, the deliverance of the nation of Israel from Egypt. You remember the plagues that happened on the land of Egypt. And the last one was the death of the firstborn. And God said to the Israelites, he said, on that night before, he said, you'll kill an innocent lamb. Jesus, of course, was the lamb of God. Uh, you'll take the blood of that innocent lamb and you will put it on the doorpost and on the top of the door, on the top and on the sides, which just happens to make the picture of a cross, on the top and on the sides. And that blood ran down and that picture of a cross was a picture of the innocent blood of the Son of God that will be shed for us to forgive our sins. And you may not know this, but where the word Passover came from was what God told to Moses. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The death angel will pass over you. Of course, that is a picture of salvation, of how when uh, God sees the blood that has been applied to our heart, when we trust him by faith, that Jesus removes our sins, he covers our sins, he forgives our sins. And the Bible says not only does he forgive us, but he justifies us, he declares us to be righteous, and he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west from us. And the Bible says that he will remember our sins no more. Well, what a beautiful picture. But there's another picture, and the story of Tamar gives us this picture. You may not be familiar with that story, but Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. Now, Judah was one of the 12 sons of Israel, and it's where the 12 tribes of Israel came from. They were named after and descendants of these 12 sons of Israel. And Judah, you may have heard of that. Jesus was the lion of the tribe of Judah, okay? So we know that Jesus came from the line of Judah. But did you know that Judah was not always a good man? Judah was not always innocent. In fact, what saved him and what's so incredible about him was his uh, ability or his willingness to repent of his sin. He had a daughter-in-law named Tamar. Tamar was married to his oldest son. Now you have to understand the culture back in those days, thousands and thousands of years ago, the culture was very different than the culture that we live in today. It was a very patriarchal culture and the oldest son would become 
kind of like the king of the family. And the families would live together in families and in clans. And the, the, old, the oldest son would become the male leader of the family. And it was a very, very important position. He would get the majority over half of uh, the inheritance from his father. And the other children would divide the inheritance. But he would be the leader of the family. And you can read this in the Old Testament. But there was something called leveret marriage. Now, leveret marriage is something we don't practice today, but it was something that was simply God's grace to protect women in that culture. It's not that God uh, approved necessarily of having multiple wives. He did not approve of that, but it was the culture. And you have to understand that a woman whose husband died in that culture would be often left to total poverty and her entire family could starve to death. She wasn't able to go out and get a job like women can in our culture today. Uh, it was a very different culture that, than the one that we live in today. So God told the Israelites that if the husband, the oldest son, died and he had not had a child with his wife, that the next oldest son was to take his older brother's hus uh, wife rather, and to uh, bring her into his family, and he was to uh, have a child with her, and this child would then become the patriarch of the family, the leader of the family, and he would be considered the son of the oldest brother. Well, Tamar's husband died because the Bible says he was a wicked man. And then his uh, uh, Judah gave uh, the younger brother, the next oldest brother, to Tamar as a husband. And the Bible tells us, and I'm not trying to be too graphic, but you can read about it in the book of Genesis. Uh, the Bible tells us that he, in an act of rebellion, spilled his seed on the ground. Now, you can figure out what that means, okay? He was determined not to impregnate uh, that woman. Why? Because he did not want, first of all, to obey God, and he did not want to provide for that woman. And as far as he was concerned, she could rot and die. And the Bible says God also killed him. And then Judah got very worried. He's like, my sons keep on marrying this woman and they keep on dying. And he had a younger son and he told Tamar, he said, I promise you as soon as he is old enough, you can have him as a husband. But Judah never planned to keep his promise. Years passed. Tamar was still evidently in the household of Judah, but she was not being cared for. And as she saw that uh, Judah's next son began to be old enough to be married and he was not given to her as a husband, she decided to take matters into her own hands. How many of you know that when you take matters into your own hands and try to take them out of the hands of God, it never works out very well? Well, she did something that any way that you look at, even though she was a victim, and even though that uh, she was being mistreated, she shouldn't have done, she dressed up as a temple prostitute. And you have to understand in that culture in those days, uh, the different religions, they would have what were called temple prostitutes. And when people went to worship these false gods, they could also have sex with a temple prostitute, male or female, okay? It was a very wicked culture that they lived in. And so Judah, the one that would be in the ancestry of Jesus, he's out doing his business one day, and he sees this woman dressed up as a prostitute. Now, while they would dress up as a prostitute, is they would take a veil, and they would cover their face so that you could not see their identity, and they would sit on the side of the road, and Judah, he calls some of his servants over. He says, who is that woman? They did not know. He said, I'm going to go and sleep with her. And he did. And of course, she, he did not recognize his own daughter-in-law. And he said, well, I'm going to pay you. And she said, how are you going to pay me? He said, well, I'm going to give you a sheep for my flock. And that's how he planned to pay her. And she said, well, how do I know you're, keep, you're keeping your word? Because she knew he had been a liar in the past. And, and he said, well, here's how. Uh, I'm going to give you my staff and my signet or my ring. Now, you need to understand, once again, just as the way we've looked at old uh, uh, medieval types of movies and seen a king with a scepter and a ring, that was basically the same thing. 
He was giving her his signet or his ring, which would serve as uh, the seal for the family, and his staff or his scepter, uh, and he gave those to her to hold until he paid her. And when he paid her, she was going to give it back to him. Well, as soon as he left, she got up, she left, and she uncovered herself, and she went back to her business, and Judah sent out his servants. He said, where is the temple prostitute that was here? They said, we don't know what you're talking about. And he said, I'm not going to keep looking for this woman. He said, they're going to mock me, and they're going to find out what I've done. And so he decided to keep it a secret. About six or seven months later, Tamar was pregnant. It came to her father-in-law's attention, Judah, and he was outraged. Oh, this woman has played the harlot. That's what he said. Oh, not holding himself to the same standard. He said, oh, she deserves to die. And so they gathered her around. They gathered around all the people to watch justice be given to this woman, so he thought. And before they began to stone her, they were going to stone her to death. She said, he said, who is the father of this child? And she pulled out his ring and his staff. And she says, the owner of these two things is the man that has gotten me pregnant. And the Bible says that Judah was immediately repentant. Now, obviously, he was sorry for getting caught, but he was also sorry for his sin to God. And he said, she is more righteous than I am. Well, ends up that she ends up being pregnant with twins. And during the time that she was giving birth, the first baby, and they were, they were twin boys, uh, the first baby put out his hand, and she, uh, her servant, took a red cord and tied it around the baby boy's hand and said, this one will be the eldest son. He will be born first. Well, as it happened, he took his hand back into the womb and the other boy was born first and he was born second. You say, well, Richie, why in the world would you tell us this crazy, crazy story? Well, you need to understand that Judah was in the ancestry of Jesus. But so was Tamar. One of her boys was one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. Now, I tell you that story uh, not to, to try to make it sordid sounding, but I tell you that story to show how God will redeem your past when you confess and when you give it to him. Both of these uh, were mentioned, obviously, in the, in the lineage of Jesus. Um, now, both... Tamar and Rahab. We're talking about Rahab today. Both Tamar and Rahab were both mentioned in the ancestry of Jesus. And the reason that that is such an incredible thing is because in those days, women were not mentioned in the ancestral uh, records. The mothers were not considered. It was always so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. And these women were mentioned in the ancestry of Jesus, and we can see how that uh, God redeemed their past, no matter how bad it was. Both these women, Tamar and Rahab, were foreigners, by the way. They weren't Jewish by blood, but they became a part of the ancestry of Jesus Christ. They were both prostitutes, they were both marginalized, and they were both outcasts. Now, friend, I want you to know something. It doesn't matter what your past is. Maybe you feel marginalized. Maybe you feel like an outcast. Maybe you feel like no one has accepted you, but I want you to know that God himself, Jesus himself, specializes in those kinds of cases. You may feel like you're too far from God. You may feel like you're too, mar- too much gone. You may feel like it's too late for you, but I'm here to tell you today, it is not too late, and you have not gone too far. Why? Because God redeems sinners. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.15, it says, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I and the worst of them all. That was the Apostle Paul writing that. He came to save your soul and to redeem your past. Hebrews eleven thirty one. by an act of faith, Rahab, the Jericho harlot, welcomed the spies and escaped the destruction that came on those 
who refuse to trust God. I want you to understand something today. You are not defined by your past, but by your future. And when you come to Jesus Christ, no matter what your past look like, looks like, you might feel like you're an outcast. You may be a marginalized person. You may feel like that no one loves you. You may feel like that if anyone knew your past, they would not love you. They would not accept you. But I want you to know that God tells us that it is through our faith that Jesus will redeem us. You will not be defined by your past. You will not be defined by the things you, done, you did yesterday. You will not be defined by those things that uh, you have put under the blood of Jesus Christ, but rather you will be defined by the future that you have in your relationship with God. Not only that, but you're not marked by your failures, but by your forgiver. Isn't it interesting that all these thousands and thousands of years later, we're still talking about Rahab. We're, we're still talking about her faith. We're still talking about what she did. You're not going to be marked by your failures, but by the God who forgives you when you give your life to him. And I know that for many of us, the devil likes to sit on our shoulders and whisper into our ears about all the things that we've done wrong, about all the ways that we've fallen short, about all the times that we've blown it, about all the times that we've messed up. But I'm here to tell you today that it is not your past that defines you. It is the Lord your God who will define your life. It is not the lies of the enemy, the lies of the devil that will define you, but rather it is the truth of God that will define your life. And the next time the devil tries to remind you of your past, you just remind him of his future and you go on with God. So what does God do with our past? He'll redeem it if you'll give it to him. Here's the second thing he does is he covers it. He covers it. I'm going to read to you from the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. I'm not going to read but a couple verses. But I want you to notice not what's there, but what's missing. Not what's there, but what's missing. You see, you may not know this, but the Bible was not written in the chronological order that you read the books. Now, most likely the book of Genesis was the first book written, and the book of Revelation was the last book written uh, in the Bible. But all in between, they're grouped not by chronological order but by categories for example the book of Hebrews where we read about Rahab in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 31 was written several years before the gospel of Matthew the first book of the New Testament but Matthew was uh, grouped together it was not even the first uh, gospel written Matthew was grouped together with Matthew Mark Luke and John and the book of Acts and the reason for that is the gospels show the acts of Jesus and the book of Acts show the acts of the apostles that Jesus empowered, okay? So there's a reason for the way that it's arranged, so it's not chronological in order always. But I want you to see how God, over time, changed the narrative about Rahab. She was called, in the book of Joshua, a harlot. Not just that, but a brothel owner, a madam. She was the outcast of outcasts in the society that she lived in. In the book of Hebrews, uh, she was referred to as Rahab the Jericho harlot. Still not a lot of change there. But I want you to see what was left out in Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And Salmon. Now I know that for many of you that looks like the word Salmon, that's the proper way to pronounce it, not like my dad pronounces it, Salmon. Or if you're from South Georgia, Salmon, that is not the correct way to pronounce that word. Salmon is a name in the Bible. It is not a fish. Salmon is a fish, okay? Consider yourself educated today. All right, so sa uh, Salmon, I almost said Salmon. Uh, Salmon, the, the father of Boaz by Rahab. What's missing? She's no longer called a harlot. She's no longer defined by her past. 
And I think that is very intentional. It says, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, who was also an outcast woman in that culture, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. I got to tell you today, folks, it's not your past that matters. It's your redeemer that matters. And when he redeems your past, he will cover it as well. Jesus is an expert at covering the sin. You see, not only does he redeem you and forgive your sin, but he covers it. What do you mean by that? He covers the shame. You see, there are so many people that walk around in this life, even after they've become Christians, that they bear the burden of shame. They're shamed by their past. They're shamed by their failures. They're shamed by their shortcomings. They're shamed by the things they've done. They're shamed by the things they haven't done. And there are so many Christians that will simply walk around carrying a burden of shame. But I want you to know how great our God is. Not only does he forgive your sin and remove your sins from you as far as the east is from the west, he will also remove the shame from you so that you no longer have to walk around under that burden, under that dark cloud because of your Redeemer. God will remove the shame. You see, in Hebrews chapter 11, the only two women that were mentioned were Sarah the wife of Abraham and the father of Isaac, who was a very moral and respected person, and Rahab, who was very immoral and was an outcast in society. And Rahab sold her body. Uh, Sarah would never think of doing such a thing. But I want you to know that both of them, both of them equally needed a redeemer. Both of them equally needed a savior. And did you know that being a religious and moral person who's not a Christ follower, who's not a believer, that that is just as bad as what Rahab did? You see, the point is this. It's not your morality that saves you. It's not how good you are that takes you to heaven. But rather, it is your relationship with God. It is your faith in a holy Savior. You see, what they had in common was that they both needed saving faith in the living God. And what they had in common was they both had saving faith in the living God. And they both needed salvation. God is an expert at redeeming your sin and then covering your sin to remove the shame. And then here's the last thing. He uses it. He'll redeem your past He'll cover it, but thank God he will also use it. You see, that's one of the beautiful things about becoming a Christian, about following Christ, that no matter what your past has been, that he can use it for him. My wife and I met a man in Hawaii that was a pastor, and it was a miracle how he became uh, into that position to be able to be a pastor on staff at a church because just several years before that, He was a man that was on death row. He was never going to get out of prison. He had committed murder as a younger man. But as God only can, uh, that man got saved in prison, and he began to study the Word of God. And he said, God, I don't know how you can use me, but I'm going to give my life to you. You may only use me here in this prison. Well, several years later, after that church that he worked at began to have uh, ministry there and, and help him, that man was... Uh, what do you call it? He was, his, his sentence was uh, transmitted by the governor of the state of Hawaii, and he was released, and he began to serve God by serving others. And today, he is on staff at a church, and he goes back into the prison that he used to be in, that he used to live in, and he serves God by serving those prisoners. You see, God not only can cover your shame and redeem your sin, but he can actually use your past. You see, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. God can turn your misery into a mission. God can turn your defeat into a destiny. And it doesn't matter what it has been in the past. God can use you. Isaiah 61 verse 3, it says, He will give a crown of beauty for ashes. 
Aren't you glad that God specializes in that? He takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. He takes our ashes and he gives us beauty. You see, we don't have anything to offer God other than the ashes of our past. But when I give my past to him, when I freely put my faith in him, he will redeem my past. He will put my sins under the blood of Jesus. He will wash them away. And he will, without doubt, he will remove the shame. He will cover the sin. And if my faith is right, God can use the past that I thought was so terrible. And yes, it was terrible. And yes, it was sinful. But God can take ashes and turn them into a crown. And I hope that's what you will allow God to do for you today. You've heard me tell many, many times about my father being an alcoholic and becoming a Christian and uh, God calling him into the ministry. I haven't told you about some of the aspects of it. One time when I was a little boy, my dad was lying. He was so drunk. He was lying in the floor in his own vomit. And I was destined to follow him. I was destined to live the kind of life that he was living because his dad before him did that. His uh, grandpa before him did that. My great grandpa, we could go on and on and on in our family history. My dad, so drunk, so out of control, so unbelievable some of the things that he did. He gave his life to Christ. I was just a little boy. We sat in church for the first time as a family, and I was on my dad's lap, and it was that day that my dad heard the gospel, and the man that pastored that church grabbed his hand on the way out of that church, and he said, Roger, would you not like to be saved today? And my dad, who was so shy, he would never have walked in front of a group of people. He said, I sure would. And on that day, my dad gave the ashes of his life. He was just a young man in his mid-twenties. He was already headed for the rocks. He was already headed for divorce. He was already headed for destruction in his life. He took the ashes of his life, and he gave them to God. And God took the ashes and turned it into beauty. My dad, the one that was so far from God as a young man, later became a deacon at a church. And then later he st- served on staff at a church. And then later he served as a missionary to a foreign country. And he pastored a church in Arizona. And toward the end of his career, he started a church as a church planter. Surprise, surprise, the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I had no idea that God would have me walk that same path. My dad started a church, a beautiful church there in North Carolina, that God used him to win so many of his family to Christ and so many of his friends to Christ and so many of the people in that community for Christ. How can a story like that happen? There's only one way. God is able to take your past and he is able to take your ashes and to turn it to beauty and to give you a crown. And that's what God will do with your life if you'll let him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that you have, for those of us that have been uh, saved, that are Christians, you have turned our ashes into a crown of beauty. And God, we want you to know that we're so thankful. We want you to know that we are so blessed by you, and we're so happy that you did it for us. And so, Father, I pray for people that may be here today that need to experience you giving them a crown for the ashes of their life. I pray that today they would receive Christ as their Savior. I pray that today would be a great day in their life. I pray for those that are Christians, but they're still walking under the cloud of shame. They still can't seem to escape their past. They still seem to believe the lies of the enemy. God, I pray that you'd help them to trust you today that you will remove the shame. And God, we want you to know that we love you today. And we thank you. Before I finish my prayer, with your head bowed still, those of you online watching, if today you need to trust Christ as your Savior, 
I invite you right now to give the ashes of your life to God and he'll give you a crown of beauty. I wonder if you'd like to do that right now. If you would, you can pray something like this. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, and that he rose from the grave. And I believe he died for my sins. And today I come to you, not telling you of how good I am, but that I need a Savior. Not telling you of how righteous I am, but asking you to forgive my sin. And Heavenly Father, I want, to know, I want you to know that I want to receive you today. I want to receive Jesus today as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If today you prayed that prayer online, would you click the button at the bottom of the page to let us know that you prayed to receive Jesus today, that you're willing to give him the ashes of your life for the beauty of a crown that he will give you. If today you did that in the room, I hope you'll take the next step card, put your name and information on it, and check on there that you pray to receive Christ today. Uh, that way we'll have a record of it, number one, and we'll get you connected, number two. We'll help you today take your next step. Maybe today your next step is baptism. We're going to have baptism on September the 12th, the same day that we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. I hope you'll grab one of the uh, cards on the way out today. Invite somebody that used to come. Invite somebody that's never been before. Help them to celebrate with us uh, our 20th anniversary on September the 12th. I think you'll be glad that you did. And uh, we're so very, very happy that you're a part of our church today. Uh, maybe you need to uh, sign up for the Next Step class. We just had the Next Step class today. We'll have it at the end of next month as well. You can go to the next one. And so whatever your next step is, I encourage you today to take it if you would. Last thing, we are going to uh, today have our luncheon uh, after the service for all of those that are interested in doing our part, uh, finding out more about our vision, finding out more about our campaign and what we're doing. And so if you will, uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, it's a free lunch. You can hang out afterwards. We'll have that in the lobby. And so we want you to know that we love you today. Thank you for being here with us today at Avalon Church. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.